The Pillow Talk. The saga begins with King Eilil and Queen Maeve of Connacht laying in their bed arguing over who has the most amount of wealth. Eilil tells Maeve how much better off she is since marrying him. When she disagrees, they decide to tally all their individual wealth, which was exactly equal, apart from one prized white bull called Finbianach, the White Horned, which originally belonged to Maeve, but walked into the herd of Eilil because it felt being owned by a woman was beneath him, even if she was a queen. She hears of another bull equal in power and majesty, only it belongs to a man from Ulla, or Ulster, in the north, called Dara Macfiachna. Maeve dispatches messengers to request the bull, offering 50 yearly heifers, land in a plane, and, quote, her friendly ties on top of it. If he merely agreed to lend her the bull, Dara jumps at the offer and agrees. Later the messengers become drunk and let it slip that Maeve would have simply taken the bull by force had Dara not agreed. Dara rescinded the agreement immediately and vowed never to loan the bull and sent them packing. When Maeve heard the news, she said it was well known it would be taken by force, and taken it will be. And so the Tawn Bow Cooley begins. Ali and Maeve begin assembling a great army from across all of Ireland to band together in her cause and fight the men of Ulster, who have meanwhile fell under their pangs, a curse that was placed on the men of Ulster by the goddess Maka in one of the pre-stories to the epic. It renders them incapacitated and unable to fight. Cúchulain, his charioteer, and his father, Suladim, are the only Ulster men not affected by the pangs. Maeve meets a prophetess who warns her of a great warrior who is to come. The army encounters Cúchulain. The armies of Alil and Maeve set up camp and having inspected the armies, we get an account of the vast crowd assembled, along with the various warriors and great leaders among the horde, notably the former Ulster king Fergus MacRoach, who Cullen's foster father, who is now the enemy of King Conover MacNessa after he was tricked out of his kingship and now fights for the armies of Maeve. Verdia is also there, who Cullen's boyhood friend, training partner and his close companion. The war spirit now on was felt by all in the air that night. The assembled army was troubled in their sleep and Cúchulain knew he must prepare. He asked his father to go and warn the men of Ulster. Next he takes a branch, makes a hoop and carves a challenge in Ohm, leaving it high and a standing stone for all to see. When the army came upon this, Fergus MacRoach was the one to read it. Quote, Come no further unless you have a man who can make a hoop like this with one hand out of one piece. And I exclude my friend Fergus. End quote. The druid said a great champion had made this as a barrier against kings and that the royal host must come no further according to the rules of war, unless someone among them could meet the challenge. The next morning, Cúchulain and his charioteer Laig set out to survey the invading army. Afterwards, he cut a forked branch off a tree and embedded it deep into the middle of a stream to prevent any other warriors from passing. Soon the boy hero makes his first kills, lobbing off the heads of four warriors and impaling them on four points of the branch. Fourteen chariots were broken trying to remove the branch from the stream. Eventually it was dislodged and the war had begun. The saga then takes an aside into the boyhood deeds of Cúchulain told by Fergus MacRoach to explain how such feats must be from the hand of the young boy warrior. Who else but the Hound of Ulster could do such works? Death, death. What follows is a series of skirmishes of stealth and outmanoeuvring as the boy hero slays scores of enemy soldiers using traps and cunning. He also picks off warriors sent to challenge him by Maeve in single combat, starting with Freyk MacMideg, whom he wrestled into a river and drowned with his bare hands. This pattern continues as Cúchulain flawlessly destroys wave after wave of enemies. Meanwhile, the brown bull, Don Cooley, is moved to Schlieff Cullen, tossing Erd back with his heels as he moves across the land. Alone, Cúchulain swears that he will remove Maeve's head with a slingshot the next time he lays eyes upon her. From Finnevar Cooley to Connolly. Alan and Maeve's army split at a place called Vinever in the district of Cooley and set about searching for the great beast, rounding up all cattle, women and children for Maeve's inspection. She was displeased when the bull still hadn't been found. The armies continued to march on, eventually coming to the great ford on the Cron River where they would meet Cúchulain. Again, he slew hordes of men sent to fight him with no apparent effort, sometimes 30 at a time, sometimes 100 at a time. Time went on like this for a while as the army camped on the opposite side of the river unable to advance any further. Fergus MacRoach warns Alil that they must act soon, as the Ulster men would surely be soon rising from their pangs. They decide to negotiate with Cúchulain to stop him from using his sling to kill their men at night. He refused. They offered him bondwomen, cattle and land, but he refused all they said. Finally, he agreed to limit his assault to single-hand combat on the condition that no cattle leave Ulster for a day and a night after the fight. The armies agreed they would only advance during the fighting. Single combat. What follows is a series of single combats where Cúchulain is pitched against the strongest and fiercest warriors from Alil and Maeve's armies and he is easily victorious each and every time. The bull is found and more single combat. 
Meanwhile, the great brown bull Don Cooley is being searched for by a troop of Maeve's men, led by Bui McBorn in the district of Cueve. But Cucullin followed them and stopped them in their tracks with 15 heifers, killing their leader with a spear thrust through his armpit. Cucullin fends off more challenges of single combat, as Alil and Maeve send waves of their most accomplished warriors. Cucullin and the Morrigan during a lull in the fight and he is approached by a strange woman who we know to be the Morrigu. She foretells that she will come against him while he is struggling in battle, promising to come in the shape of an eel to trip him underfoot, a she-wolf to stampede the beasts of the fort towards him, and a hornless red heifer to trample him in the waters. To which he replies he will crack ribs with his toes, burst her eye with a sling stone, and hurl a rock at respectively. This comes to pass and Cucullin does all he promised. The pact is broken. Great carnage. Eventually he is ambushed by six of their warriors who attack him at the same time. He cuts them down, but the pact is now broken. Maeve, frustrated at the loss of her men, offered a false hand of peace to Cucullin, hoping to draw him out. When fourteen javelins were thrown at him, he masterfully dodged all of them without bearing a single scratch to his armour. The fourteen men who threw them quickly lost their lives. Dismayed by this, Maeve even offers to grant large tracts of land to Cucullin if he agrees to leave her armies alone. Gradually the armies reach Merhimna Plain and settle at the site, which will come to be known as Breshlek Moor, the Great Carnage. At night they could hear the war cries and the spear shaking of Cucullin, the Hound, as spectres and demons of war flew frantically above their camp, killing 100 warriors with fright. One night Cucullin is visited by his divine father Lu, who healed his wounds and leaves him in a magical sleep which lasts for three days. Gradually, the men of Ulster begin to wake up. When Cucullin finally awakens after three days, he is informed by Laeg that while he was sleeping, three times fifty of the boys of Ulster fought three battles each day and night and slew three times their own number. Yoking his sickle chariot to his horse, equipping his battle weapons, Cucullin and Laeg set off to defend Ulster again. His combat with Fergus and others His single combat against Ireland's mightiest warriors continues in the same fashion, though he must fight greater warriors and those for whom he has a fondness and companionship with. Recharged with the divine healing and rejuvenated by his divine father's assistance, Cucullin emerges for battle, looking majestic, mighty, magnificent. So much so, that the wives of the men of Connacht climbed and sat upon the shields above their men's heads to get a better look at the warrior. It came time for Fergus McRoak to face the young hero. At first he refused to fight his foster son, as he had sworn never to fight him. And should Cucullin ever come against him in battle, he swore that he would retreat. But they got him drunk, and they implored him to do it, and so he eventually changed his mind. However, coming face to face with the boy, his foster son, he refused to draw arms and fight. So they each agreed to yield, and, true to his word, Fergus retreated from Cucullin. Maeve sent waves of warriors to find and kill him. First twelve, then twenty-nine. But as you might probably expect, all of them died. The Combat with Ferdia the greatest and the most tragic of the single combat episodes involves the battle between Cucullin and his boyhood companion and foster brother Ferdia. Maeve offers Ferdia land, fame, fortune and her daughter if he agrees to fight Cucullin. He is shamed and embarrassed and he agrees to fight Cucullin as a matter of honour. The battle lasts days and each of the warriors laments his task. Neither wants to harm the other but they must. Someone must win. Someone must be killed. For three full days they fight. At night, they send medicines to attend each other's wounds and food to restore energy. After a long drawn out and harrowing battle, Ferdia is finally slain by his boyhood friend Cucullin. The place is known today as R.D., which comes from the Irish Oth Ferdia or Ferdia's Ford. Ulster Rises Suildum, Cucullin's earthly father, runs to Erwin Maka to raise the alarm and rally the men to aid his son. Only it was an offence to speak before the king, and the king could not speak before the druids. After some time debating this transgression, Suladim runs off in dismay, and the men of Ulster begin to mobilise. Just as Cucullin becomes too battle-weary and too exhausted to fight, the men of Ulster begin to rise from their pangs, and from all directions the Ulstermen came to Erwin Maka, ready and waiting for Cunniver's move. What follows is a series of pitched battles and negotiations between the warriors of each side, not to fight one another until the last great battle, which was soon to come. The companies advance. Cunivor MacNessa and Alil spend the whole night attempting to negotiate a truce, but to no avail. Meanwhile, Maeve has the brown bull Don Cooley carried off to her homelands of Connacht. Cucullin is wounded too badly to fight, 
So he is taken to a tent to heal by his charioteer Leg. Their tent overlooks the field of battle, and Leg recounts what he sees. Before morning's first light, he sees some servants from each of the camps run out to chase animals, which leads to them brawling. Next, the beardless boys join in the fight, then the higher-born men, and soon, men are running naked into battle, clutching only their swords and shield. A great clamour began as blood was spilled on both sides. The Last Battle Cucullin lay helpless but burning with a desire to go to his countrymen's aid in the fight. It wasn't until Laeg told him that the great crash he had heard was that of Cunever's shield clashing in battle with his old nemesis Fergus MacRoick. Cucullin was finally overcome, unable to hold himself back any longer. He entered his battle rage and began his warp spasm. He lifted his whole chariot on his back and ran off to find Fergus on the battlefield. He finds Fergus and reminds him of his pledge to retreat should he ever come across Cucullin in battle. Fergus agrees and he departs with his troops, leaving only Elil and Maeve with their seven sons and nine troops of 3,000 men on the battlefield to face the Ulstermen alone. Maeve took command of her forces from behind a wall of shields to make sure the brown bull Don Cooley would get safely away by whatever means and no matter who should die. The story then tells how Maeve was overcome by her bodily functions and was forced to retreat from command so she could relieve herself. And this is how Cullen found the queen and the place which came to be called Fuel Maeve, or Maeve's fell place. But he would not kill her in this position. Instead, he ensures her and her armies leave by watching them cross Ireland as far as that long. The battle was over. Maeve said to Fergus, We have had shame and shambles here today, Fergus. We followed the rump of a misguided woman, Fergus said. It is the usual thing for a herd led by a mare to be strayed or destroyed. The Battle of the Bulls Arriving at Cruachan in the Kingdom of Connacht, the brown bull Don Cooley let out three almighty balls, calling out to the white-horned bull, Finn Bionic, to come and face him. All who returned from the battle gathered around to watch the powerful beasts scrapping each other, brawling into the night until only the grunts and sounds of their anger and agony could be heard by those still watching. They scrambled and fought across the countryside until the brown bull Don Cooley was seen in the morning galloping past Cruachan with the flesh of the white bull Finn Bionic in his horns, scattering loose pieces of his flesh here and there as he made his way back home to his country in the north. When he finally reached the borders of Cooley, his heart broke and he died on the spot. Mm-hmm.